Carnegie Mellon is an excellent university, but it is a stressful place. People aren't happy. They're just, they're kind of just, uh, it's not good. It's not a happy place. One of the things that Severin and I decided early on when we were starting a company is like, look, whatever happens, uh, you know, our company should be a happy place. By the time Louis Van Aan turned 24, he was already a millionaire several times over. The 43-year-old may not be a household name, but I'm willing to bet you're one of the hundreds of millions of people who use this technology every day. Louis isn't your average unicorn tech founder. He actually pays his drivers to give feedback on their interactions with potential executive level hires on their way to and from the airport to weed out toxic personalities. All right, Louis, thank you so much for taking some time out. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. There are three numbers to look out for in Lewis's story. 42,000, the amount he made each week digitizing copies of the New York Times, 183 million, the total amount of outside investment he raised, and six and a half billion, the total valuation after Duolingo went public in June 2021. Here's how Louis Van Aan built Duolingo, one of the most popular educational apps in the world, while managing to keep it free for almost everyone who uses it. For CNBC Make It, I'm Nate Skid. This is Founder Effect. Lewis grew up far from the Ivy Leagues in Guatemala. His mother was a doctor and made sure he learned English at a younger age. For many people, that can be the difference between a life of struggle and one of opportunity. How big of a deal do you think it was to go to an English program um, in terms of setting on the path that you ended up that you ended up on? I think it was a huge deal. In, in Guatemala, for example, you could probably double your income potential by just the fact that you know English. Like you don't have to need it, know anything else. There were two formative moments in Lewis's young life. The first was witnessing the tension in his family's candy business between the owners and their workers. Different people in my family would, uh, you know, a lot of times just have this vision that it's like kind of us versus them. The second was a visit from a recruiter from Duke University who was scouring Central America for undiscovered academic talent. And she essentially kind of, she didn't quite fill out the application for me, but she almost filled out the application for me. And in 1996, Lewis moved to the United States to attend Duke University with no money to his name. Yet he still managed to graduate at the top of his class with the goal of becoming a math professor. But that dream didn't last long. I realized that all the professors that were in math were doing research on problems that hadn't been solved for 500 years or whatever. Lewis wanted to spend his time and energy tackling new challenges. In 2000, he was accepted to a computer science PhD program at Carnegie Mellon. But it didn't take long for him to develop a knack for creating profitable businesses. In 2003, he created a simple game pairing two players and showed them each the same image. If their descriptions matched, they moved on to the next one. What they were doing is basically just telling Google what's in these images. Um, and so that, that, that really, you know, kind of improved image search, et cetera. Lewis says Google bought the game in 2003 for a couple million dollars. In 2006, Lewis landed on his next big idea after listening to a talk by Yahoo's chief scientist. The problem was that spammers were writing code to steal millions of email addresses and flood those inboxes with junk mail. Lewis's answer was called... It's this thing called a CAPTCHA, which is these distorted characters that you have to type, um, uh, you know, all over the internet whenever you're buying tickets on Ticketmaster or uh, whatever. You just, you know, you get this image of kind of messed up characters. Um, so we came up with that. that. That was our idea. About 200 million people take 10 seconds out of their day to fill out a CAPTCHA. And while some would sit in amazement at their impact on humanity, Lewis suffered from pangs of guilt which led to his next big idea. And so if you multiply 10 seconds by 200 million, I started thinking, okay, that's that turns out to be 500,000 hours every day. I started thinking, okay, can we can we make good use of these 500,000 hours? This gave to this, uh, rise to this kind of next project, which was called reCAPTCHA. So it's to be just it's like a, a redoing of CAPTCHA, um, where the idea was that as people were going to, they were typing these, uh, uh, you know, over the internet, not only would they be authenticating themselves as a human, but they would helping us to digitize books. Word of the new tech reached the New York Times, which was in the process of digitizing about 150 years worth of old newspapers. Lewis charged the Times $42,000 for every year of content he digitized. We could digitize an entire year of content in about a week. Um, so pretty quickly we started getting checks for 42,000 bucks, like, you know, <laughs> about one a week. Lewis founded reCAPTCHA in 2006 and sold it to Google in 2009 for an undisclosed sum, but he said it was in the tens of millions of dollars. In 2006, Lewis was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship, also known as the Genius Grant, that came with $500,000 and no strings attached. It's not like you apply for it or anything. Just one day you get a phone call um, and they just ask if, you know, 
fortunately I picked up the phone because you know nowadays if I get a random phone call I do not pick up the phone so what did you do with the five hundred thousand dollars put in the bank account uh I, honestly I, I probably spent it mostly on uh, a, a little seed funding for this recapture so um where did the aha moment for a a, a language service come about where did this happen yeah, that was so. I was that was around 2009, 2010. Um, I had sold Recapture to Google. I had a PhD student named Severin Hacker, who is my co-founder at Duolingo. Uh, at the time, we hadn't started anything. One of the insights was, you know, computers are getting much smarter, and we could make it so that computers really could teach everybody, as opposed to teachers having to teach everybody. That was kind of the idea. Now that they knew they wanted to teach. They just needed to agree on a subject. Eventually, we settled on teaching languages. And the reason for that was because both of us have, you know, both of us learned English. So we thought, okay, let's do something to teach English. The other thing that we really wanted to do was we really saw technology as a way to, to be able to really democratize education. The beautiful thing with technology is that it doesn't cost you that much more to teach more people than just to teach one person. Um, so we thought, okay, well, we teach everybody and, and we could teach them for free. And just like that, Duolingo was born. Well, sort of. So um, how do you come up with the name Duolingo? We looked at a lot of names. One of the ones um, was F-L-O-O-N-T, which should sound kind of like fluent, but it more sounded like flunt. And then, you know, my friend said, oh, that sounds like I flunted all over the floor. Like, it's like not good. Um, so we had, we had a bunch of names. Eventually we came up with not Duolingo, but Monolingo. And, and it, that sounded like a, like an illness, like you have monolingo. And at some point, it just duolingo made a lot of sense. Now that they had a name and a mascot, it was time to turn their idea into a business. Instead of applying for a grant through Carnegie Mellon, in 2012, Lewis reached out to Union Square investors and secured $3 million in seed funding. So they had just invested in like Twitter and Tumblr, and they were like the biggest thing out there. And Foursquare was also the biggest thing out there. And so Union Square Ventures was like, oh my God, like amazing. Okay, so um, can you tell me the amount that Series A from Union Square was? Yeah, I mean, one thing that is important to mention is Series A back then, this is the year 2012, were very different than Series A today, which today is just massive. So in 2012, a very nice Series A that you were happy with was $3 million. $3 million. Today, that's not even called a Series A. Today, it's like seed funding. Around that time, Lewis gave a TED Talk. And at the end, he made mention of this really cool new application focusing on language that he was working on. Well, that talk went viral, and soon, Duolingo, which at the time was just a landing page with a place to put an email address, had a waiting list with over 300,000 names on it. At the time, the other thing that was going on at the time was uh, there wasn't really a good way to learn a language on the computer. I mean, the, the thing that there was was Rosetta Stone, and it was like super expensive. It was like a thousand bucks. And so there was this thing that just said, you can learn a language here and it's entirely for free. And so a lot of people were like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give you my, um, my email. Um, and so, you know, that, that worked out pretty well. The instantaneous interest in Duolingo and his proven track record helped Lewis raise even more capital, $183 million in all. He used almost all of that early investment money to build out a team, and for the next three years, he focused solely on growing his user base. He didn't even think about monetization. Up until 2017-ish, Duolingo was making no money. This was uh, not, it was, our, our finances were very simple. Simply, we spent money on mainly people's salaries. Um, and that, that, that was, at, at that point, though, we decided it's probably time to make Duolingo be a self-sustaining business. And we started actually monetizing and, and it has worked out very well. By now, Lewis says Duolingo had about 10 million active users and was the number one education app in the world. Now they just had to figure out how to make money while keeping the app free. We didn't just want to say, you know, turn around and say, oh, just kidding. Um, now you got to pay. So what we ended up doing is we ended up coming up with a business model that ends up being pretty similar to, say, what Spotify does or what the dating apps do, which is um, you can use Duolingo as much as you want for free. Uh, but uh, um, if you don't pay us, you have to see some ads at the end of a lesson. And then if you want to turn off the ads, you can pay us to subscribe. And then we turn off the ads and we may give you other kind of premium features. So that, that, that combo of ads and subscription worked out really well. 
Um, and so we ended up making a, you know, it, it, every year since then we've made more and more money. A full 94% of Duolingo's active monthly users opt for the free version, which includes some ads. But the company makes most of its revenue from the other 6% of its users who are paying subscribers. From 6% of our users give us the majority of our money by now. There are more people in the U.S. learning languages on Duolingo than there are students learning languages in all U.S. high schools combined. And one of the reasons for Duolingo's success is that it feels like a game. In fact, the app keeps track of how many consecutive days a user logs in. Skip a day, and it goes to zero. We have over, by, by now, I mean, we haven't quite released the, the, the figure, but uh, we have released this one, which is we have over a million daily active users who have a streak longer than 365. So we have so more than a, they haven't missed a single day in the last year. What day did you IPO? What was it like for you personally? Were you nervous? Do you remember the moment? It was extremely exciting. I mean, it was a big milestone for the company and, and for everybody who has been working on this. I mean, Duolingo has really good employee retention as in like people really rarely leave Duolingo. So most of the original team is still here. And so there's been all these people that have been at this for, you know, the last, I don't know, eight, nine years. Um, so it was, it was pretty transformative. What me. happened to the share price? Our share price was $102. Um, it went, it, it went really high. I mean, uh, uh, the first trade was 140, some, I don't know, maybe 141 or something like that. Some, I don't know the exact number, but it's around 140. And then it just kept going up, et cetera. You don't know. I, like, that would be like plastered on my wall is like a big memory. <laughs> you know, share price is, um, I, 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 I was told by a lot of CEOs of publicly traded companies not to pay too much attention to share price. And I've been doing that. And it's actually really good feedback. Here's basically what your share price moves randomly with like basically no connection to what's going on with the company. What was the biggest money mistake you've made along the way with Duolingo? I don't feel bad about anything we've done. By the time we went, we went public, we still had a hundred and some million dollars in the bank account, meaning we had only really spent 80 million. Of course, we hadn't been making some revenue the last few years, et cetera. But basically, we could have raised a lot less money. Uh, and by raising a lot less money, uh, you know, I think um, us employees, me and the rest of the employees would have owned a larger fraction of the company. When I was talking to the management team about uh, interviewing you, uh, one of the other senior producers said that she had gotten very far um, in, the, uh, in the interview process of Duolingo. You guys flew her out to Pittsburgh, you mm -hmm. put her up, and she said that even though she didn't get the position, the culture and the vibe at Duolingo stayed with her. And she was like, Nate, you have to ask about that culture. And so it dawned on me when you were telling me about this candy factory that you watched and then hearing about the culture that you created. And I'm wondering if you can kind of sew that up for me, like what you learned there and what you apply now. Most tech companies, there's a lot of employee churn, meaning like people leave the company, et cetera. Very few people leave Duolingo. It's because it's a, it's a good workplace. And I think that there's two reasons for that. I think the you know, what I, what I saw with, with my family and, and this is not, it's not that my family was doing anything bad or anything. It just in, in, in a, in a country like Guatemala, uh, uh, there really is a kind of a boss versus employee, like us versus them kind of thing. And, and I, I saw that that really didn't work. I mean, it's much better when, when everybody is, is much more egalitarian culture. So Duolingo has a, uh, you know, in as much as possible, a very egalitarian culture. That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, when, when we were at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon is an excellent university. I have nothing bad to say about it. It is really an excellent university, um, excellent for artificial intelligence, excellent for all kinds of things, but it is a stressful place. And people, when you enter the buildings there, you, people aren't happy. They're just, they're kind of just, uh, it's, it's not good. It's not a happy place. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that Severin and I decided early on when we were starting a company is like, look, whatever happens, uh, you know, our company should be a happy place. Lewis has a unique way of weeding out potentially toxic employees. I'll tell you some of the things we've done, by the way, even for executives. Um, whenever we fly an executive for an interview, uh, or, or not just executive, for a lot of people, whenever we fly them, uh, um, we have a driver come pick them, go pick them up in the airport. And we have a set of drivers that, that, that are the same uh, everywhere. We actually, that's part of your interview and people don't know it. Um, it is how you treat them. And so we, we get feedback from the drivers about how well they were treated. And so 
and now normally that it, most people are just perfectly fine like just like uh but we have we have not made offers to very very um qualified competent people because they were nasty to our driver and we're like oh we don't like that because that just means you're gonna um you know you're gonna be nasty to the little people and we don't want that and so so yeah i think that that, that type of stuff has really helped Lewis's businesses have been incredibly successful, and yet they all seem to serve a greater purpose. The picture matching game had the added benefit of generating SEO terms. CAPTCHA helped Yahoo and many, many other digital businesses decipher between humans and robots, and reCAPTCHA is helping to digitize the world's books. And these ideas have made Lewis incredibly wealthy, but he's most proud of the culture he created at Duolingo. A lot of the people that come work at Duolingo do so because they love this mission of, you know, developing the best education in the world and making it, uh, you know, universally available. 